I don't know, is Dan here? Is Dan Berman here? He is. Okay, hey. So Dan, who's been a leader in nuclear cardiology and in CT, is we're uh, thrilled to have him here today. Uh, cardiac CT angiography and nuclear cardiology, the uh, latest technical advances. Dan, good to see you. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to come. Great to uh, have you. Uh, uh, to come here. Uh, I'm going to talk about CT with uh, Dr. Mamarian, going to talk about uh, nuclear cardiology later. So I'm going to focus on CT given the uh, short briefness of this uh, presentation. So we'll cover several technical aspects of CT, moving away somewhat at this, uh, on this lecture from the uh, case approach to just looking at what's new. Uh, these images for some time have given us excellent resolution. We have to remember this technique has only been available since about 2005. It's a very young technique, and yet it's come a long way. And this slide was from uh, imaging that occurred uh, many years ago now, uh, and they gave beautiful images. But they're not beautiful images in all cases with prior equipment. We can take it even further. What's happened with the newer scanners that are now common is that some of them will cover the whole heart in a single beat, enhancing perfusion assessment as well as the coronaries. Some systems have higher temporal resolution uh, where there's approximately 16 frames per second, giving us far less motion and less blurring of the arteries. And then the radiation doses that used to be considered high with CT have now been reduced to the level of one to three millisieverts. Just to introduce where we might be going, an ultra-high CT scanner is now available called the Aquilian Precision from Toshiba. This image, this uh, scanner has a slice thickness of 0.25 millimeters and a spatial resolution in the uh, transverse plane of 0.15 millimeters. It's not too far off from what we achieve with echo. Here we see a comb phantom with this ultra high resolution CT on top and the standard CT uh, shown on the bottom. We see at the two millimeter level that we actually can distinguish the prongs of the comb where it's just one blur with the standard technique. The standard is quite high resolution. Uh, but not coming close to what we see there. We see what can happen with these slides, uh, with this approach. By the way, these slides lent to me by Dr. Sagnako Moriyama, who's had the most experience with this technique. Uh, and we see a stent where on the right, you can't see that there's any uh, abnormality, but you see uh, a, a mod mild narrowing underneath the stent uh, in the area uh, of, uh, in, the, uh, in the coronary with the high resolution method. This improvement in resolution also allows for much more accurate definition of plaque that I'll mention as being extremely important. We see the plaque, on the, uh, we see the stenosis on the coronary angiogram below, but we have exquisite detail, not only of the uh, stenosis and the lumen, but of the plaque characteristics with the ultra high resolution machine. And these plaque characteristics are increasingly important in our determination of risk uh, from CT. CT is turning away from just looking at stenosis to also looking at plaque and to quantifying this plaque with automated methods. Dr. Motoyama again gave us insight into this several years ago where the, blue, the uh, green arrows are pointing to the outward margins of the plaque and there's positive remodeling, a high risk feature, and the red arrow is pointing at lipid density reflecting the necrotic core uh, within the plaque. Both of those have turned out to be high resolu uh, t tend to have turned out to be adverse plaque uh, features predicting risk. Moriyama took that a step further where she combined uh, high, res high risk plaque and significant stenosis. Top left, high risk plaque, top right, uh, stenosis alone, and the combination of stenosis plus high risk plaque better predicted uh, long-term uh, long uh, cardiac events at two years. 
Our group has taken this another step farther in terms of quantification of plaque. Uh, this is a, an approach called auto plaque, where we measure not only the stenosis, but all the volumes of all of the forms of plaque from calcified plaque, which is easy, to the various types of non-calcified plaque, which are more hazardous. In this work, uh, we published in the European Heart Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging, we see that the various components of non-calcified plaque are important in predicting long-term cardiac mortality. On the upper left is the non-calcified plaque volume overall, the top right, the volume of that low-density necrotic core. In the bottom left, the total plaque burden. And then on the bottom right, something we call contrast density drop, which is related to the physiologic significance of a coronary lesion. Look at these two cases. This is from some time ago, where we observed early on that there might be some added benefit of plaque over stenosis. On the top, on the left, we have a stenosis that is higher grade than the stenosis on the right. But we see in, this, in the right image that the outer margin of the plaque is causing uh, positive remodeling. And there's an area of low density uh, near that proximal calcification that is the necrotic core. So which one is likely to be ischemic? Well, obviously, I'm showing it as a case example. The one with the higher grade stenosis has no ischemia, whereas the one uh, with, with high-risk high plaque features was causing ischemia. Recently, we've demonstrated that if you take all the features that are available uh, from quantitation of plaque and put them together with artificial intelligence approaches and using machine learning, that we actually, actually can predict a lesion-specific ischemia as measured by FFR in the cath lab. The outer, uh, the inner uh, is the, uh, the green line is just the risk factors. The red line, stenosis alone, and the outer blue line is the computer learning of all of the data that can be currently obtained uh, from the uh, from the plaque imaging. We see in the images that the uh, red is the non-calcified plaque and the uh, yellow is calcified plaque. So machine learning of all CT variables puts things together uh, better than we can as clinicians for everything that's available on a scan. You'll hear more about that in a lunchtime lecture. This approach, now that we have quantitative analysis of plaque, can be used effectively to monitor therapy. Uh, here we have on the left a patient with a lot of, of uh, non-calcified plaque in red at baseline, who at follow-up at three years has a shrinking of that non-calcified plaque. We can actually reverse coronary disease, as we've had some information about from IVIS. But now that we're looking at it with CT, we see that that reversal is actually quite common. We've studied a group of patients uh, 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 that will be presented at the ACC. As shown in this slide, just looking at the patients who had an LDL reduction over a three year, of a four year period of time, and those who didn't have LDL reduction. And on top, we have the patients who did not have LDL reduction, and all forms of plaque uh, were seen to increase at, over time. On the bottom, we have the patients whose LDL decreased, and all forms of plaque, except for the calcified plaque, shrunk over time, just simply with a significant decrease in LDL. What we see is that calcified plaque increased so that calcium scanning is not useful for monitoring interval change. Another article re uh, recently put, uh, uh, submitted for publication is from the Paradigm Study by Heck J. Cheng and Jim Min, where they say, found the same finding in a large group of patients, calcified plaque increased over time, whereas the other non-calcified plaque components decreased significantly over time in the statin-treated statin patients compared to the statin-naive patients. So this plaque assessment give, gives us a method for assessing the effects of therapy. It's a reproducible quantitative assessment of global plaque, the burden of, glo of, of plaque features, 
both regional and global, uh, for non-calcified fibrous, fibro fatty, and low, attention, le low attenuation plaque. And it's going to be, I believe, important for a serial assessment for both clinical trials and for management of patients. CT perfusion is a technique that is not as widely used as the plaque imaging, which can be done, which is done on everybody, because the CT perfusion measurements require an additional ejection during pharmacologic stress. There are two forms. It's a static perfusion image that is done at one, uh, just one point in time, and a dynamic image collecting data over the arrival and washout of uh, radioactivity uh, from the heart. Uh, the static perfusion imaging has lower radiation and is the one that's been most commonly studied. We see at about six o'clock, uh, five o'clock to six o'clock in the image on the left, a perfusion defect, subendocardial uh, in the inferior and infralateral wall. The approach, as I mentioned, requires pharmacologic stress and has higher radiation associated with it. The standard static imaging with lower radiation uh, has been demonstrated to be more effective than standard uh, stenosis assessment alone in predicting ischemia when compared to a combination of cath and uh, uh, and uh, a combination of cath and spec imaging approaches overall this prediction of ischemia or prediction of functional significance could be important at assessing the significance of borderline stenosis during stress and also giving us an opportunity to look at dense calcification where the lumen cannot be visualized on ct you'll hear more about the next approach which is to use the resting ct scan for assessing non-invasively the fractional flow reserve. It's acquired from the standard typically acquired scan using comp uh, computational fluid dynamics with no additional radiation and no uh, additional acquisition, no modification to imaging, and no adenosine or regadenosine. Uh, this approach then comes up with what we call FFRCT. Its limitations is, are that you uh, have to go to Heart Lab, you have to send your images to uh, the company that's developed it with significant added expense. Large registry uh, of data, the most recent, with their most recent version of software, has demonstrated that there's a, a higher specificity of uh, FFR uh, CT for predicting FFR in the cath lab than there is with either CT stenosis in blue or with the stenosis assessment in the cath lab shown in pink. Two images, the top seems to have uh, less of a stenosis than the bottom, but it's got high risk plaque characteristics. And we see the FFR CT being low in the top image and being normal in the bottom, providing that extra assessment. Now, in the future, it may not be necessary to send these studies off if we use that approach of machine learning that I mentioned to look at the significance uh, of lesions. So it's not relying on computational fluid dynamics. This study developed by Siemens uh, is a multi-center study in five sites demonstrating in that right graph that there's a superimposition of the uh, uh, the ischemia prediction using FFR, uh, using a computational fluid dynamics approach, and using the approach based on machine learning. Finally, we could potentially turn with CT into actually having a physiologic marker from the CT alone. Now, this is very early data to suggest that there's a biomarker in CT. And this came uh, in, in a, art, an excellent article in the Science Translational Medicine, where the perivascular fat density was examined. The perivascular fat uh, has a higher density than the fat that's uh, two centimeters removed uh, from that from the lumen from the wall, uh, and that's due to the smaller adipocytes that are seen in the setting of inflammation. The inflammation inhibits the maturation or growth of the fatty cells that is not seen in the normal uninflamed vessel. 
it's due to what we are considering a paracrine effect uh, that uh, results in higher pericoronary fat density because there's less fat in the smaller cells. That study was done on the proximal part of the right coronary. Domini Day, the developer of the autoplaque method, has demonstrated uh, in uh, uh, work that has been submitted that you can actually use this perivascular fat assessment in areas uh, that are uh, associated with individual plaques throughout the coronary tree. There's increased pericardial fat, pericoronary fat density uh, in, in, in uh, it, plaques that have adverse plaque features. So finally, just to put something together that I've been mentioning pretty much all along, and that is that machine learning of CT variables is likely, by taking into account all of the things we can learn from CT, to be uh, higher in its accuracy than we can be from simple visual assessment. Work is in its infancy, and at this, uh, in this study that was in the European Heart Journal, uh, we showed that there was a, a with the simpler analyses of CT, putting them all together with machine learning, uh, beat the assessment of uh, stenosis alone. So summarizing what I've covered, uh, this young technique is actually uh, uh, under a dynamic change. Uh, there are scanner improvements uh, in coverage, temporal and spatial resolution. There's lower radiation associated with the newer equipment. We have the opportunity now to measure plaque measure plaque quantitatively in an automated fashion, giving us a tool for assessing medical therapy and better prediction of functional significance. We also can derive functional assessments beyond stenosis with the two methods I described, CT perfusion and CT FFR that you'll hear more about uh, later today. And there's an exploratory uh, study using biomarker assessment evaluating the pericoronary fat density that might give us information about the activity of a plaque that's not available through the standard methods. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>